But they need it because of the thing. And the thing is, right, again, because they're so focused on the convenience of that premium passenger, they make planes, they time the planes for perfect convenience. So all the flights from Australia, for example, arrive in Singapore, arrive in KL, perfectly timed, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, boof, the flights to Europe take off. Right? So you have a seamless uh, connection. Great. You're very pressed for time. But what that means is, again, daytime, go to PLIA, the big planes are idle, sitting on the ground, waiting, waiting for a convenient time to depart because of connection or because of the, the convenience to the premium passenger. And as a result of that, assets are being used 50% of the time. So all we did was to say, hey, you know what? I bet there are a lot of people out there whose first consideration is price. Simple. Right? So if it means you depart at 3 p.m., you depart and uh, arrive at 4 a.m., doesn't matter. Because if you can save 800 ringgit, 1,000 ringgit, family of 4, 4,000 ringgit, you know, that's your entire hotel budget, or for some of you, maybe your shopping budget. You know? So um, all we did was basically strip out the idle time. We do the same exact maintenance because that's regulated. And we achieved the world's highest aircraft utilization rate at about 17 hours, just by stripping out the idle time. And when we started, we only had one plane, right? So one plane, uh, it flew to the Gold Coast four times a week, it flew to Hangzhou uh, five times a week. And it would have different times. You know, some days Hangzhou leaves in the morning, the next day it leaves in the afternoon. But again, to the passenger, these are not people who are the business people who memorize flight schedules, you know, from your you guys are your bosses, right? They memorize the flight schedule. So our passengers might be going to London or, or Melbourne once a year or once in a lifetime. They don't memorize flight schedules. They look at price first, you know? And that's the reason that we're able to achieve this. A simple insight, right? That you serve a completely different customer segment and you get a high utilization rate. So simple, instead of uh, 12 hours a day, we fly 17 hours a day, right? So we get about 13, 35% extra use for the asset. And every plane, we have more economy seats. We've got about 30% economy seats because we don't have so many first class and business class that takes up about one third of the real estate on the plane. So when you've got 30% more seats on the plane and you're flying four hours a day more, 365 days a year, you get extra flying hours for the same price of the plane, right? That means if every seat is 50% cheaper, you get the same revenue for the same cost of the plane. Simple math. And that was the simple insight. How was it? That was, that was what allowed us to, to get to the cost structures that I talked about. But it's really understanding that uh, when you serve a different customer, right, you can achieve completely breakthrough results. One of the problems of a lot of people that tried to do low cost long haul before is you start by hiring people from the airline industry. So you hire people from the airline industry, they just basically tweak, oh, this is the way we do things, we do things. So you know you might get a 10% improvement, a 15% 15 improvement, right? But this is tiny us with a handful of planes, right? And our this is the world's lowest unit cost of any major airline, or any airline that I know of. 2.9 US cents per available seat kilometer. So the unit cost in an airline industry is the total number of seats in your fleet times the total number of kilometers that you fly versus a typical uh, legacy carrier. So this is not a 10% improvement, a 20% improvement. It's more than a 50% improvement. Because if you don't have that big of a cost gap, guess what the others are going to do? They're going to squeeze you, match your prices, and, and you know, squeeze you out of the market. But when that gap is that big, they can't touch you. you know? And that's a big difference. Look at on the right hand side, interesting. I mean, most people ask me, well, what do you need to do about high fuel, high fuel? You know, all the airlines, again, everybody same mindset, right? Oh, hedging, hedging. Any bankers here? <laughs> no one wants to get their bankers today, I know. It's uh, oh, very brave, so, uh, you know what? These guys are bastards. <laughs> because the way hedging works, in case you think an airline tells you, oh, we hedge 50%, no, we hedge 60%. Do you think that they're any better? No, they're not. Because you know what? Either side the price moves, the bank gets the money. <laughs> I we, we got burnt in 2008. I learned a very tough lesson on that one. But um, the thing is, you don't worry about price because 
hedging is not going to give you a sustainable advantage. You know, one particular trade you might be five or ten percent off better than the other guy. The next trade you might be 10 five percent off. But when you have that big of a fuel consumption difference, you bet that's a sustainable advantage. And that's what we're more focused on. How do we get much better at using every single drop of fuel? And that's the obsession that we put into the culture and, and, and the company. Much better than having to deal with fuel. But you know what? No airline, you read newspapers, talks about this. Uh, they talk about fuel hedging, fuel hedging. Why? Because the analysts are asking the questions. Any analysts in this room? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, one part of the equation to make this work is, of course, you've got to be uh, radical in achieving a completely different cost structure. But it doesn't work if all you do is you're the best operator, the leanest operations, you're the world's lowest cost structure, if you can't fill up the planes. And that's the other thing we've been really focused on is how do you create a new way of generating demand? Because again, Here's another area where airlines have just been very, very uh, traditional. Airlines wait for their customers to come to them. Think of that, the sheer arrogance, right? They wait for their customers to come to them. You decide as a passenger, oh, you know, this July school holidays, I'm gonna go to um, Korea, I'm gonna you know, take my family there, talk to your family, you can decide on the day, get your leave from your bosses, book your flights, you know, call the travel agent, or, or you go online and book your hotel rooms. That's how you purchase travel. That's how people purchase travel in the last few decades. We decided, no, you can't do that. You've got to go out and create demand. Because if you wait for people to come, you can't, right? So we flipped the decision opposite. Today, with AirAsia, as most of you hopefully will know, um, people sometimes don't even, you know, decide where they're going or when they're going. They wait for the area sale. <laughs> so they, they log on to me, okay, they know. They, smart ones, I'm sure most of you, right, uh, are registered AirAsia.com users, so you get an email beforehand, ah, sale coming. And these days, with Twitter, some other people know a few days beforehand, right? So they log on with their three laptops and two mobile phones ready to go on the night. You know, they think, hey, I might be going to Bali. I really want to go to Bali, but you know, you try and you can't get it, but DMTF for nine, bring it. Grab DMTF for nine. I have no idea where DMTF is, but I don't care for nine, bring it. I bought it. You know, and you thought you're going in July, but it's for March of next year. And so you just buy it, then you Google, oh, it wasn't in Austria, it's in Laos. <laughs> So then you, you know, start buying tickets, now get your hotel uh, and go back to your boss and say, okay, you know, next March I'm going. You flip the, the, the purchasing decision opposite, right? You don't wait for people to come to you. Think of the new demand uh, that gets created. Uh, July, a couple of years ago, I went on a, on a flight to the Gold Coast and um, there were these big extended Malaysian family, typical, you know, goes, goes with three or four, 30 of them. They were very excited, first time going to the Gold Coast. And they, you know, they, um, they knew who I was on the plane and said, uh, I was trying to arrive at the Gold Coast. Yeah. Your ad said blue skies, sunshine, beaches. <laughs> it's cold and dark and raining outside. Yeah, July winter. Huh? July winter, they didn't even know that Australia is in the southern hemisphere and July is winter. Right? So it's a really a different customer segment. You know, these are not your, you know, the guys who've got you know uh, second homes, third homes, overseas stuff. It's a completely different customer segment. You know, you've got to create demand. Don't wait for people to come to you. You've got to go out there and grab it and use whatever means you can. And that's why, you know, when you look at uh, these numbers, that's why we keep, you know, pushing and pushing on. Back my head every time with the government saying, well, you've got to give us rights to fly. Because this is not about, you know, one airline versus the other. This is creating new demand. And the, the facts speak for themselves. If you don't believe me, don't trust these numbers. Go out to Malaysia Airport's annual report. And you can just check and see all the routes that AirAsia flies to, AirAsia X flies to and compare them to routes that AirAsia X is not allowed yet to fly to, right? You know, let's say Perth, 66%, Melbourne, 41%. Same time period, 
Sydney, minus 20%. Same time period, right? Uh, 2009, London grew by 31%. Every other European destination, no exception to Kuala Lumpur in the same time period, right? Paris, Frankfurt, uh, Amsterdam, Rome, all in minus growth. That's the impact of stimulating new demand. It can be done. You just don't wait for people to come to you. And that's the difference with the airline industry. They were all waiting for passengers to come to them. The arrogance, instead of going out there and creating, giving people new reasons to fly. That's what we got. First person to send me a tweet gets to go to Gold Coast for 199, no travel date restrictions. <laughs> Let's see how much new demand we create tonight. <laughs> so it's been, a, it's been a crazy period. Uh, and, and it's exciting for me personally to grow from a single plane uh, that took off. I, I joined AirAsia X in uh, July 2007 you know, with a small startup team, a few desks and, and a few PowerPoint charts. And we had to get our license, we had to get funding from shareholders get the first plane, and uh, it was July 07, 2nd November 2007, the plane took off on a first commercial flight, first dollar revenue earned in four months. Didn't sleep much that, month, that period, but we made it, you know, and for one whole year, from November 07 to October 08, we had one aeroplane. We were flying an airline with one aeroplane, no contingency plans, couldn't afford <laughs> It was nuts. Um, and I remember uh, we, we had to purchase some uh, we to paint deposits for, for the new planes that were to come. And uh, it was around May. Uh, we had you know, initially tended out um, documents for banks to give us loans for the new planes. And by that time, the credit crunch had hit. All the banks ran away. All these banks, now that they're coming back, they actually ran away. Uh, they, they said, There's this. What do you call that? Um, Force majeure clause that they can pull out of the contract. So they all ran away. And um, we were stuck without any money, no planes, no planes, no airlines, no growth. Uh, we were really stuck. And the only potential option, the only person who was giving up capital at that point, were the European governments uh, for Airbus because they had to prop up the exports um, because otherwise they lose jobs and you know, the politicians. It voted out. Um, amazing when you, know, you can get results if elections actually matter. Um, <laughs> sorry, I digress. Uh, so we, we, we tried to pitch, and they had a rule they don't give credit guarantees, export credit guarantees, for any airline with less than a three year profit track record. We had been operating for six months, you know, no track record whatsoever. Um, so, you know, actually they didn't want to see us, but you know, we found some creative ways of just getting one hour of their time to pitch. And uh, went out to London to the uh, Export Credit Agency's office. It was in the tube, uh, Henry Wharf. And uh, there was free newspapers in the tube. Front page, Zoom Airways goes bust. <laughs> this, is, this is not going to be an easy presentation. You know, you can see what's on their mind, but uh, you know, one of those things you give the pitch of your lifetime, um, somehow you know, convince them that we didn't have all of the typical startup risks, uh, primarily with the association with AirAsia, you know, the brand, the network, and they said, is AirAsia going to give any guarantees? No. <laughs> they said, you're on your own. <laughs> so. Uh, Again, you know, just pitched and had faith. They, they kept us waiting for about six weeks. Finally, they said yes. Lots of onerous terms and conditions, which are very painful, but nonetheless, you know, the lifeline of credit to, to purchase a few planes. So, so we got those planes and kept growing. And despite, you know, that taught me that you know you just can't say no. You've got to figure out a way of going out there, finding that that, that opportunity grab it, you know, it's the most precious thing in the world to have these few moments of opportunity amidst these crazy turbulent uh, situations that, that we find ourselves in right now. Grab it, go for it, and you know, sometimes you just gotta 
came to the park 